Lord God, be in my words. We thank you for providing for, um, for us in incredible ways. We know that you are at work. Lead our steps and open our eyes to see, Lord, more clearly um, the way that you're calling us to go. Be in, my, uh, be in this message. Guard us, uh, Lord God, from the demonic forces of evil uh, within and without. Lord, uh, that, um, well, evil within, Lord, our own old natures. May we be uh, consistent in uh, daily taking up our cross, denying ourselves and following you. And even as we sit and listen, Lord God, I pray that, uh, that we would be doing that in areas that, um, that need to change by the leading of your Holy Spirit. And also, Lord God, protect us as a church um, that we might hear the words that you have for us this morning. In Jesus' name, we pray these things. Amen. Okay, so I'm, um, I felt like this uh, Christmas season, I should focus on something other than just Acts, just for a time, just to give us a bit of a break. And as I, um, as I was kind of looking at what I should share about, I came across, of course, the Advent wreath, and ta- a lot of, uh, you know, uh, readings and prayers about the Advent season. And I thought, you know what, that's what I'm going to talk about in the, in, the, in, the two, in, the two, in the two following Sundays here, so this Sunday and next. And uh, the Advent can be uh, celebrated in a variety of different ways, but most common, it is, uh, it is seen celebrated by congregations like us, getting people from the congregation to come up and to read a bit of scripture, to read a little bit of a prepared kind of statement, to light a candle, and then to pray, right? You're kind of familiar with that. Um, but what I want to do this morning is actually kind of talk about uh, kind of the underlying themes that are connected to the Advent, so that as you, ideally in the future, um, like we're even going to do a candlelight service, right, uh, coming up on the 23rd, as we listen to that, as we pray, as we participate in the, that kind of thing, um, those kind of celebrations, that you kind of understand a little bit more deeper what, what is the intent and what is the purpose of the Advent season, okay, or the Advent kind of celebration. So the word Advent directly means the coming or arrival of a notable person, thing, or event. That's kind of just what it directly means. Though historically, what was understood to be the Advent season or the Advent celebration has changed over time. It's actually changed a lot. So uh, you wouldn't have seen the Apostle Paul doing this at Christmas time, okay? In fact, you wouldn't have seen Christians doing what we do for the most part, what we understand kind of like the Advent wreath or the Advent season, you wouldn't have seen that happening until actually much, much, much later in Christian history. But today, and I don't want to get into that history because we we don't have enough time, but today most of us understand understand this. If someone was like, hey, I'm going to an Advent thing, uh, you know, ceremony, Advent uh, evening or something like that, Or if someone said, you know, if I called you up and said, hey, would you be willing to light one of the Advent candles? That's probably what you specifically think of, okay? But there's a lot more going on, okay? There's a lot more going on, and I want us to pay attention to that. So that when you're actually reading, when you're actually hearing, when you're actually sitting and doing an Advent kind of thing, that you understand a little bit more, that what is being said actually comes out and maybe hits us a little bit harder, touches our heart a little bit more specifically, Um, Advent uh, practice or the ceremony today, normally we ha- um, there are three underlying key themes, okay, that take place. First, it looks back and celebrates Jesus' coming, his birth. Second, at the same time, it looks ahead to the hope we have in Jesus Christ's return. And third, a good Advent reading will also focus on the fact that Jesus is with us now and what we're kind of supposed to do about it, okay? So in a good Advent reading, and there's some that aren't so good, but in a good Advent reading, those three things should be taking place. We should look back in the past, celebrate Jesus' coming, look to the future hope of Jesus' soon return, and then also recognize, okay, what are we supposed to be doing about it? And as we kind of go through three of the candles this morning, I want you to be paying attention and looking for those three things. Advent symbolizes the present situation of the church in these last days. And we know that we are in these last days. We talked about this in Acts 2, 17. And you also see it in passages like Hebrews 1, 2. 1, 2. 
as God's people wait for the return of Christ in glory to consummate his eternal kingdom. Note that the church is in a similar situation to that of what Israel was in at the end of the Old Testament and at the beginning of the New Testament. Okay? So right around the time of Christ, we're actually in a very similar place that Israel was in. Let's remember that Israel was in their own country, but it wasn't really their own country, was it? It was actually really controlled by Rome. So they were in it, but it wasn't really theirs anymore. And because of that, they were praying and, 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 and seeking God to bring the Messiah who would change that, who would make their country their own, okay? As followers of Jesus Christ, we're in a similar place, right? We are in this world, but it's not our own. We're not even supposed to be of it, right? And we are waiting for the return of Christ to, 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 to bring his kingdom, right? And to actually make this world a part of the world that we are actually in, or are, are a part of, or are, are citizens of, right? And that's the kingdom of God. So we're in a very similar position. And similarly, we should be in the same place kind of spiritually, the same place kind of longing, the same kind of hope, the same kind of, we should be engaged in the same sort of seeking God, praying for Jesus' return to come and bring his kingdom to earth. Guys, to bring our kingdom to earth. Not that we're going to own it, but that's the kingdom that we're a part of in Jesus Christ. So we should be seeking, we should be longing, we should be hoping for his return. And in the Advent season, we look back to his birth and, 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 and celebrate that but we look forward with great anticipation to his coming. I pray that as we go through Advent kind of stuff, as you see, as people use the word Advent, as you see candles being lit for Advent, as you watch it online or you see little, you know, Facebook pictures and stuff like that, that that's what you're thinking. You're thinking of those two strong things. Yes, celebrate his birth. Yes, I am looking forward with great hope to his coming. And I would challenge you, how did you do that yesterday? We are in the Advent season. Did those two thoughts cross your mind? Did they shape, in, even in part, some of your words, some of your actions, right? It's so easy to be in the Advent season, right, which we are, but then the only time that we really think of those things, maybe Christmas Eve if we read the story with our family or, 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 or Sunday morning when we read that story with our family, or, you know, at a candle lighting service or, or, you know, Sunday morning when you have someone come up and do a little read. We are in the Advent season, but often we are not. It does not kind of saturate our thinking. He came. Jesus came. Let's celebrate that. He's coming back. Let's live in hope. Let's our actions, our words actually represent that hope, share that hope, speak that hope. More often than not, we light the candles, and the candles of the Advent wreath um, are to kind of honor the season. And there's five candles, as you see. The first candle of, uh, is the candle of prof prophecy, representing hope. Often they can be different colors as well. Sometimes they're not. Um, but what I want to do is I want to clarify to you each of the candles this morning, or at least the first three. And so um, you will hear this, the first candle be called the candle of hope or the candle of prophecy. Okay, so it's, it's, named, it's named either or. The second candle is called the candle of Bethlehem, traditionally, but it's also known as the candle of preparation or the candle of faith or the candle of peace, and we'll talk about that. Why so many names? This is confusing, that second one especially, but we'll talk about that. The third candle is the, traditionally, the shepherd's candle. And it is the candle of joy, or the th it carries the theme of joy. The fourth candle is the angel's candle. And it is also sometimes called the candle of love or the candle of adoration. It, it carries that name as well. It carries the theme. The, angel, the angel's candle carry, carries the theme of love and adoration. And the fifth candle is the Christ candle. And that's just what it's called, thank goodness. Okay? 
You might ask yourself, first of all, why candles? The lighting of a candle is a, is the, is a simple, yet it's a profound act. It is a testimony to the power of light over darkness. As we light the candle, we remember that it is in the light that Jesus walks, and it is the light that, and in the light there is no darkness, there is no sin, there is no fear, there is no shame. In the light of Christ, there is no darkness, sin, fear, shame, guilt. In Scripture, light represents purity as well, holiness, and light represents revelation. For in the light we see what is true, right? We are called to walk in the light as Jesus Christ is in the light in 1 John 1. And uh, when, we, when, when we look at that, it actually connects light to truth. Walking in the light is walking in truth. Advent draws us into recalling Jesus' birth as well as his second coming. Remembering Jesus' parable in Matthew 25, 1 to 13. The parable of the ten virgins. We also seek to be wise and have our lamps ready for the, bride, for the bridegroom who is coming again. And we are given that warning. It's not only in this passage, but several times. Watch, therefore. Are you watching? Watch, therefore, for you know neither the day or the hour in which the Son of Man is coming. We are called to be prepared. We are called for this idea of Advent to be constantly on our hearts and minds. So yes, we focus on his, his first coming, uh, which is in the past, and we focused on his return, which is the future. But we also focus on what does that mean for us in the present? As Max Licato wrote, the one who came still comes, and the one who spoke still speaks. And he's speaking to the idea that Jesus Christ is still engaged in speaking to us. We don't just have this past celebration and this future hope thing, but we have this daily relationship where Christ continue through His Holy Spirit, through His Holy Word, and through His holy people still continues to speak to us and to lead us and to call us closer to Himself. He continues to speak. The first candle then is known as the prophecy candle, as I said, as I said and it represents hope. Right? Um, and it's called the prophecy candle, and it represents hope because even though oftentimes we don't really pay attention to the prophecies of Jesus' coming, recognize to the people in those days, the prophecies of Jesus' coming, the Messiah's coming, is what brought hope. They paid attention to those prophecies very carefully because it's the hope that they had in their day to day lives. The prophecies told that one day a Messiah sent from God himself would come, the anointed one who would come and bring salvation and life to God's people. The theme of the candle also points our attention to consider the New Testament prophecies about Jesus' return. And in that present, and sorry, and in the present, we take hope in the promises that we are given in Jesus Christ because of what he has done and the freedom from sin and punishment that we are given. So we focus on hope. Many people feel tempted to skip over the Old Testament prophecies, and there's literally hundreds of them of Jesus' birth. Yet throughout the Old Testament, we see the story of people in need of redemption, in need of a Savior. Okay, so like, pay attention to this. How does your day look? How does your days look? Are you in that place as well? Now, I'm saying you, you already know Jesus. But even as people that know Jesus, we still need Jesus. Am I right? Because we can't actually live out what Jesus calls us to in His commands, always loving others, never being selfish. You hear me now? Always loving others, never being selfish. Always putting others first, never putting myself first. You can't do that. I guarantee you, you don't do that. You don't live out the commands that Jesus has called you to, and you can't without Him. The only way that we have the fruit of the Spirit in us, where we're patient and loving and kind and gentle, is when the Spirit of God lives in us and our minds are set on Christ. So, 
just like the people in the Old Testament looked at the prophecies and had a longing for the Messiah to come. We too should be living our days, right? Longing for Jesus. Not that he, knowing that he is with us, but keeping our attention, keeping our hearts, keeping our focus on him. That's when we'll start to, and the truth is, we'll be probably convicted of our selfishness again and again and again. And then we will turn to Jesus Christ and be like, forgive me for that. Help me. Help me not be so selfish when it comes to who has to vacuum right now. I don't really want to vacuum right now. Susanna can do it. One of the kids can do it. I don't want to do it right now. That's an easy one, right? I don't know. What do you and your wife fight about? Are you always loving? Are you always patient? See, we can't do that without Jesus Christ and us just walking with him. We can't do that without saying, I'm sorry, Susanna, right? Please forgive me. Jesus is convicting my heart. The Spirit is convicting me. I, I was being selfish there. Forgive me for that. Saying that to our kids, saying that to our friends, saying that to the people we work with. We need Jesus. They, in the Old Testament, look to prophecy for that hope. We, in, in, in our time, can look to Jesus Christ, but we are still needing, longing, seeking a Savior in our moment-to-moment, -moment, day day-to-day lives. And the cool thing is that He is with us through the power and presence of the Holy Spirit, but that is something that we need to be consciously aware of. We're not like the Pharisees, and I pray, I pray that we're not, where we think, no, we can do it on, as long as we're doing this list, we're doing it, and we don't need Jesus. No, we need Jesus to do that. Moment to moment, right? Breath by breath, word by word, word by word. So in this time, we also long for, seek after, endeavor to draw near. We also have a hope within us. The prophecies that were, that, that were spoken in the Old Testament brought daily hope. The prophecies and th that, that we have, the promises made to us in Scripture should bring us daily hope in Jesus Christ. In fact, note how early God, and, and God for God, this candle is important because God cares about hope. God cares about hope. In fact, listen to, pay attention to, note how quickly God gives man hope, okay? When's the first time that God gives man hope? hope? I'll wait for an answer, so go ahead, give me. Genesis 3, right? The third chapter. In fact, it's really a part of the second time we hear God speak. It's a part of that same kind of conversation, right? God speaks and creates the universe. Then he, he tells man, but it's not actually quoted, but he tells man, this is why, this is, this is, you don't touch this tree, you, you stay away, that kind of stuff, okay? Then he comes down and he actually, we see man, God addressing man directly again in the story. And he says, Adam, where are you? Right? And Adam's hidden. Adam and Eve are hiding. They're in the bush. They're covered in leaves. And then he starts to say, okay, did you? There's this conversation there. Did you eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? And then he gives them their curses. But even before he's done that, in chapter 3, before he's done handing out the curses to all the people involved or... I mean, the serpent, people, being, thing. You get what I'm saying, Satan, right? He gives man hope. Listen to uh, chapter 3, verses 14 and 15 in Genesis. So the Lord said to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and all the wild animals. You will crawl on your belly and you will eat dust like all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. There will be one that comes who will crush the devil's head, right? Stopping his schemes and his work. God very quickly gives hope to man, and throughout Scripture, God, by the Holy Spirit, and through his prophets, continue to offer hope. He still does today. The Savior is coming. But perhaps more clearly, we see the, 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 the prophet of Isaiah sharing us this hope. In Isaiah 7, 14, it says this, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and you will call him, listen now, Emmanuel. Emmanuel. Emmanuel means God with us. 
This statement is perhaps the greatest prophecy of hope because notice what it is saying. Notice what God is saying. In Isaiah's time, God was not physically walking with man. God was not Emmanuel. Ing. Okay? He wasn't, he was by the presence of the Holy Spirit, but not in the same way. When was the last time God was Emmanueling with man? Back in Genesis 3. So there's been several thousand years that have passed since God was again saying, okay, I am going to Emmanuel. There is going to, I'm going to be God with us with you. I'm going to be with you. I'm going to be, I'm going to be in your presence and you're going to be able to be in my presence in a unique way that, that man hasn't seen since the Garden of Eden. Okay, so that's what Emmanuel means. That, that prophecy is incredible. And he will be called Emmanuel, God with us. Isaiah 9, 2 also writes, The people walking in darkness has seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. Pay attention to the advent, the lighting of candles, why we do it. Isaiah 9, 6 and 7, For to us a child is born, to us a son, excuse me, is given, and the government will be on his shoulders. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over, and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness. From that time on and forever, the zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. How would you like to live in a country that is established by, that is built on, that functions on the main political agenda is righteousness, right? Justice, holiness. Can you imagine that? I, I mean, I, to be honest, I, I mean, it's a dream, right? But like to logically take some time to actually think about that. Okay, Jesus ruling Canada. We have Justin Trudeau. It's just hard to kind of fathom what that would look like, right? And I know that God has put Justin there and we need to honor him and we need to pray for him, right? All rulers are in place by God's hand, right? If we have a problem with that, we're probably not praying enough, right? We're not trusting enough. God has a purpose and a plan. We need to honor that. But there is a profound difference, is there not? Would you say that our political governance, the main agenda, holiness, righteousness, justice, truth, yeah? You're like, yeah, that's Canada. That's... That's why I feel like we're living there, right? It's actually probably even hard for us to fathom what would that look like. And I can imagine, actually, guys, I can imagine that many of the things that we think are actually on the okay side, that when he comes and he, and he rules, he'll be like, well, that's, you're taking part, ignorantly perhaps, but you're taking part in injustice in this area. You'd be like, what? No, no, that needs to change too, right? It won't be just Justin Trudeau who needs to change some things in his life, right? It'll be us as well. And by God's grace, we are forgiven for the things that we are ignorantly a part of. The first candle, the prophecy candle, is the candle of hope. And I pray that this Advent season, you pay attention to the hope that you have in Jesus Christ. The second candle in Advent is called the Bethlehem candle. And this is perhaps maybe the most kind of confusing candle Okay, because it's also called the candle of preparation. Uh, it's also called the candle of faith, and at times it's called the candle of peace. But hopefully I'll kind of walk you through why we have so many candles for that. Traditionally, it is called the Bethlehem candle, okay? So why does this candle seem to present, uh, represent so many different things? In the, in the name Bethlehem candle comes the idea uh, connected to the faith and preparation of Joseph and Mary, they lived out their faith and actively prepared for Jesus' arrival. So that's why it's 
the Bethlehem candle. So it's connected to Bethlehem because they traveled to Bethlehem. It's connected to preparation because it's this idea of, of preparing. It's connected to faith because even though they were told to do a whole bunch of things, Mary wasn't like, no, 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 that's not going to work for me. A virgin birth, no, no, no. All my friends are going to think that I'm, eh, and stuff like that. Joseph didn't go, no, 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 Gabriel, I'm sure God has his plans, but no, 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 no. I'm still going to put Mary away. Clearly, she was unfaithful. I don't care what you think, okay? All the guys in the club are going to make fun of me. They're going to think I'm a weakling, that I'm just so smitten by Mary that she can sleep with another man, and I still love her. And I'm not going to do anything about it. They're going to think I'm a sussy, okay? No, no, no. I'm going to do what I need to do. Our family people, our family, they, they, you know, uh, they're going to kick us out, which likely happened, right? Because they go to Bethlehem. That means everyone in Joseph's family went to Bethlehem, and yet Joseph and Mary, there's no room for them in the inn. Clearly, there's something going on there, right? Especially if you understand how families worked and how close they were back in those days. So they could have said, no, 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 we're not doing that. But that's not what they do, right? Joseph and Mary prepare, and they trust by faith. And because of that faith, pay attention now, they have peace. So the Bethlehem candle, the preparation candle, the faith, and peace. That's, why it, how, that's how it's kind of connected. Out of the things that they needed to do, perhaps most notable was their travel to Bethlehem. But even before, Mary had, had, even before that, Mary had faith in what the angel spoke. Joseph also had faith in what Gabriel spoke. And shortly after Jesus' birth in Matthew, the sto- uh, where we see in the story that the angel shows up and says, okay, you need to leave for Jesus' safety. What do we see him do? He doesn't actually seem to have any defiance to this fact that now he has to take up his family tonight, right, and leave for another country. How many of you would be so eager if you had a dream tonight? And God said, this is what I want you to do, Jason. I want you to take your family and go to Colombia. I want you to be a missionary, missionary there. Get there quickly. Tomorrow. Right? Larry, how about you? Joan? How would you guys do with that? Joseph's faith as he obeyed God was actually incredible, and so was Mary's. And uh, that all, all that took place kind of around the place of Bethlehem. So hence the Bethlehem candle, preparation, faith. And we see that because they had such faith, it seems that they walked in peace. We see this more in Mary's life than Joseph's life. But what do we see in, in Mary's in the story? And I, I'm assuming you guys know the story so well. That's why I haven't just read the story for us. It's familiar to us. But what do we see in Mary's life? We see joy. We see celebration. We see praising and prayer. And we see these uh, treasuring these things in her heart. Treasuring these things? Woman, you weren't at a hospital. You had to give birth in a barn. You're treasuring that? Because they had such faith, even though the circumstance wasn't ideal, she had peace, right? Bethlehem, preparation, faith, peace, right? The aim of, aim of the candle is to point us and point our attention towards faithful preparation, but it also seems to point us towards understanding that living by faith brings peace. We recognize the peace that Jesus Christ provided when we trust and obey. We can have peace while we are engaged in preparing and working towards the things God calls us to. We can, like Joseph did and Mary, and even like the shepherds, because they, they get brought into this as well. We can be engaged in obeying what we have to do as we prepare for, pay attention now, as we prepare for Jesus' second coming. Because aren't we supposed to be, right now, engaged in that kind of preparation? Engaged in the things that we're called to do to prepare for His second coming? (coughs) Note again that we look at Christmas story in the past, and then it draws our attention to Jesus' return in the future. 
And it calls us or it questions us, what are we doing to prepare now? How are we doing in our preparation? In our preparations for Jesus' return, are we walking in faith? Right? And you know what's the evidence of that or the litmus test to that? If you have peace. Right? Do you live your days in peace? even as you go about the things that God's calling you to do, right? That's a good question. That's a scary question. If peace in the things going on around me is the verdict of my faith in trusting Jesus Christ as I engage in preparing, as I engage in the things he calls me to because he's coming back, how am I doing with that peace Having hearts full of peace is a hard thing to do in our fast-paced society, is it not? We want things to happen fast, and we, we get frustrated and, dare I say, lose our peace when things don't happen the way we want and, and, and when we want. We want to, the stoplight to change quickly, the groceries, the grocery line to move faster. We want things at work to go as we think best. And we don't like and treat others poorly who might think differently than us. How are you doing at loving that person who's driving too slow or driving too fast because it's icy? How are you doing at that? Where's the peace? We forget that before good things happen, preparation must be made. And as we walk trusting in Jesus Christ, we can have peace, having faith in the fact that He is in control. Often passages of Scripture that speak to peace and preparation are read in the lighting of the Bethlehem candle. Passages like Luke 2, 14, where we read, The angel sang to the shepherds, listen now, Glory to God in the highest of heavens, and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. And where in that story, where, do they, where can they find this little one that brings peace? In a manger, wrapped in swaddling clothes, in the city of David, Bethlehem, the Bethlehem candle, preparation, faith, peace. Or passages like Matthew 3, 1 to 3 are also read. In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. This is he who speaks of, of this is he who was spoken of through the prophet Isaiah, a voice of one calling in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight paths for him. The Bethlehem candles pointing to preparation, faith, and peace. The second, candle, the second candle calls us to remember the preparation done in faith and done because the one who was going to bring peace had come. Today, we who believe know that Jesus Christ brings peace. And we are called to prepare and be engaged in preparation for his next coming. Let us this season hear anew God's voice calling us to be at work preparing the way for the Lord. The third candle, and this is our last one, is called the shepherd's candle or the candle of joy. One of the readings I found says this, Jesus is coming, shout for joy. Joy is a word we see and hear everywhere at Christmas. Joy to the world is the message of the season. Joy is the theme of the day. The third candle on the Advent wreath is called the shepherd's, um, is called the shepherd's candle. It remembers the first in a long line of people who joyfully shared the good news of, Savior, of our Savior's birth. Luke 2, 10 to 18 reads this. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in clothes and lying in a manger. Suddenly a great company of heavenly hosts appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest of heavens, and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. When the angels had left them and gone into the heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in a manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. 
And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherd said to them. The shepherd's candle focuses, on our attention, focuses our attention on living in joy as we remember Jesus has come and has died on the cross for our sin and rose again, defeating sin and death. We are to live in joy because we who believe in Jesus Christ know he has come and by faith we are forgiven and free of the judgment that we deserve for our sin. Do you live your day like that? Do you know that? Do you remember that? The third candle, the candle of the shepherds, the joy candle, is about remembering what Jesus Christ has done for us and therefore living in joy. Living in joy. We live in joy because He came, because Christmas was followed by Easter. We have joy because in Jesus' coming and His one-day return, we are promised eternal life, promised to be once again fully able to be with God, Emmanuel, God with us, and us with him. No more death, no more sin. Listen now, only joy. Only joy. The third candle is about joy. Uh, in closing, I want to read to you three, three prayers that I found in connection to the joy candle. Okay? Let's, let's, let's pray. Lord God, create in us a fountain of joy. Lord, by your Spirit, stir in us, stir in us joy so that we are almost ready to dance. Kindle in us a fire of gladness, set loose in us songs of praise. For you are the one who comes with healing and blessing and offers us salvation and freedom from our sin. God, may this be so in us. Dear God, with joy we acknowledge your care and love for us. With joy, we acknowledge that our help is in you, the maker of heaven and earth, our maker, and our remaker through the life and death of Jesus Christ, the one who was born in Bethlehem. Through faith in him, grant us solid joy that lasts long beyond this Christmas season and that equips us to face the struggles of our day-to-day -day life. Lord God, may it be so in us. And dear God, we rejoice in the forgiveness of sin by faith alone in Jesus. We rejoice that you have made us new creatures in Jesus Christ. With joy, we commit ourselves to the proclamation of the good news of great joy. In our Lord and Savior's name, we pray these things. God, may it be so in us. Amen. Guys, I pray this week that hope lives in you. That preparation is what you engage in by faith and that through that faith you have peace. And I pray that you have great joy. I pray that you will have great joy this week as we remember that we're in the Advent season, the time when we remember that Jesus Christ came. And I pray the time that we remember that Jesus Christ is coming. Jesus Christ is coming. Amen.